Hiya, I'm Steve Burney. Welcome to The Bike Show. It's official title, the 2003 International Motorcycle and Scooter Show, which is just as well, because this is a 60-minute special devoted entirely to scooters. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't want a scooter, they're slow, they're unsteady, they get stolen for fun. But think about it, how much sense does it make to commute by car? Well, it makes less sense to commute by superbike. So at the end of 60 minutes, you'll be convinced that what you need for the job like that is a scooter. This is Britain's best-selling scooter, not just last year, but for as long as anyone can remember, the Peugeot Speed Fight. It's almost a classic. And this little cutie is the cheap, I mean, the most affordable scooter in the entire show. Give them a thousand pounds and they give you a pound change back. It looks a lot like on the club because, well, basically, that's what it is. And this is the fastest scooter you'll find anywhere. There may be others with the same 100 mile per hour potential as the Yamaha T-Max, but through the twisties, nothing will live with this baby. And this Leviathan, the Suzuki Berman 650, is the heaviest, the most powerful, and the most expensive scooter currently on sale in the UK. Weighing in at 244 kilograms, it produces a massive 50 brake horsepower, and it's yours for a whopping 6,300 pounds. But however fast, slow, small, large, affordable, or excruciatingly expensive these scooters are, they all have one thing in common. They need petrol to make them go. But not all scooters need petrol. And just the other day, I went down to London to try out a new range of scooters that run on the same juice as one of these. Hello? No, I can't talk now. I'm on the telly. Go away. <laughs> electrically powered scooters and bikes in the UK before I've actually ridden a couple of them but they've really been one man and a van operations this time though it's far more serious there's a six bike lineup a glitzy PR launch for it and the man to tell me all about them is Tony now this one's a swap yep and this is kind of your starter model isn't yeah, it yeah that's right this uh, is uh, 1699 once you've had your 200 pounds back from Gordon Brown lovely because it's on the power ship register and yeah. uh, the government's keen to promote green transport so that's a good result so in use how does it work this thing oh, it couldn't be simpler steve it's, uh, it's it's like your mobile phone except it's got wheels you have to right. plug it in every now yeah right. it's uh, it's it's twist and go i mean it's as simple as that you turn on the ignition yeah it beeps at you a few times lets you know you're on uh, you open that throttle and away you go but the rules and regs aren't the same as they are for a 50 are they yeah they're they're pretty much the same steve yeah you have right. to show your tax disc as well even though that there's actually no charge for there's no tax, charge so you still have to show the road you should, tax. Still have to show the disc are you sure it'll be a thrill because it's kind of uh, isn't it a glorified mobility scooter oh you, come have, on have you got steve. a sporty one i mean, I mean <laughs> surely could there not be a really sporty version of one of these? Yeah, is there absolutely. any reason why there shouldn't be? No, the technology is, is building all the time, Steve. You really think that you're going to convert car drivers rather than attract existing motorcyclists, scooter riders? Yeah, I think there's a big market among um, you know, frustrated car drivers who are yeah. tired of the, the, the slog to the petrol station in the morning and the expense of it all. Um, these are a very viable alternative to those slow, polluting journeys. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, it's a very convenient way of getting around. This isn't the first attempt to launch electric scoots in the UK, but this is the real deal. A full range of machines, including a police special, built to comply with zero emissions legislation in Italy. And don't worry, that's coming here soon. I was impressed, but what about the man from Scootering magazine? The black one that I rode, this is like, it's really quick, it's really immediate. Uh, it's 
probably one of the best I've ever ridden, to be fair. I've ridden a few of the electric ones, and yeah, the black one's pretty cool. Most of them, they'll refuel in about eight hours. One of them will refuel in about an hour. It'll give you a 60% charge, but you know, who's got an hour to hang around? Yeah. And also, they say it's really easy to plug it in and, and charge it up at your house, but I think people will get a bit lazy. And if you live in a flat, what are you going to do? You, know, <laughs> you, you can't want to lead all the way down, down 10 stories to plug it in. <laughs> Mm, he's got a point. Still, with a fully charged battery and wearing a rather stylish crash helmet, I think you'll agree, I set off into London traffic to find out if electricity is the fuel of the future. It's actually very surprising how nippy this thing is off the mark with two people on it because I've got a, quite a substantial caramel on the back. What I can't stop myself doing is slightly blipping the throttle when I stand still because I'm so used to doing it, even on a Rev and Go scooter. Just give it a little bit of a blip. This thing takes off straight away. I've never ridden or driven anything that had such an instant pickup. The weight of the batteries is carried very low, and it feels a lot more substantial than uh, most 50cc Rev and Go scooters. It'd probably be about 25 kilos heavier. The throttle's a bit like the, the switch for the bathroom light. It's kind of either on or off. It's one of the two. It's very hard to set off. Slowly and steadily, it's kind of oh, off you go. <laughs> say I'm far more impressed with this uh, range of electric scooters, particularly this one, the one that I've ridden. Um, the performance is certainly very respectable for this sort of traffic. would be absolutely useless out on the open road, but that's not what it's for. It's for getting around urban gridlock in a zero emissions kind of a way. If you're environmentally friendly, if you've ever hugged a tree in your life, you want to get it from A to B in a way that's clean, quick, economical, reliable, and you'll be able to park when you get there, then this might be just the thing to you. One addition to them, I think, might be a cowbell. You know, like they have on uh, on cows <laughs> in Switzerland, so that you can hear the things coming. Because the number of people, I almost just hit a pigeon because it couldn't hear me coming. Now, those electric scooters are catching on quick in Europe, and another continental craze is big wheel scoots. This one is the Peugeot Luxor 50. Yours for £1,800. The bigger wheels offer an increased feeling of security and stability. Very popular with the ladies, which is perhaps why this one has been painted all over with nail varnish. Another manufacturer who thinks the way to the ladies' hearts is to paint your big wheel scooter with nail varnish are Honda. This is the SH125 and it's yours for just £1,900. The ultimate big wheel scoot though is surely Piaggio's exciting new B500, but is it a big wheel scoot or is it a maxi scoot? The chat to answer that question must be the top man from Piaggio, Martin Marshall. So Martin, what is it? It is the new maxi scooter. It's a new class, it's a new sector that we're developing. It crosses over between what you would consider to be the existing maxi scooter that starts to bring in motorcycle technology in the size of uh, the wheels and the suspension and the braking. So it really is a new sector on its own. Stability, the suspension, the braking system, it is delivering that sort of performance that they're expected and they're, and they're used, used to in, in their car world. Yeah, we've got a 16-inch front wheel. I mean, is this, strictly speaking, a motorcycle? It starts to get to close to motorcycle technology, and that perhaps is the other area that we're looking at, is that motorcyclists who, they would love to ride their motorcycle every day of the week, perhaps they're, they're, they're working again in the sounds of the cities, but actually maybe a motorcycle is a little bit impractical. Yeah. This is, you, you put your helmet on, you chuck on some, uh, some uh, warmer gear, and you're, you're in your office in, in next yeah. to no time. But again, they still have that big wheel comfort, that big wheel stability thing that they're used to riding a motorcycle. Yeah. Of course, it's much slimmer than most of the maxi scooters, isn't it? So filtering traffic. Filtering traffic, usability, coming through, coming through those clogged up city, city lanes, it is absolutely perfect. It just squeezes into those gaps, it's perfect. It's not really got any competition at the moment, has it? It hasn't got any competition at the moment. It, again, the maxi scooter sector in the UK is developing. It's, it's only 
been in existence, let's say, for the last two or three years. And I think we still have a big education job to do in the UK with, as we say, with car users who are using the car, sitting in traffic every day, and motorcyclists who want to use the bike but actually feel it's a bit impractical. So we've got a lot of work to do, and I think that's the strength of Piaggio is that we've got now a fairly diverse range. We've got B500, we've got the new X9500 Evolution, and of course the new Gelera Nexus. So there is something there for everybody, and using those three completely separate and different uh, model lineup, then I think you're going to see big steps forward in the, in the Maxi scooter. The handling and performance of the B500 are a match for any Maxi scooter, but it can filter, which is a huge advantage. It'll have anything away from the lights, and out on the open road, it's quite astonishing. But this is East Lancashire. What about riding a scooter around London? So much quicker. I mean, get anywhere in about 20 minutes and just zip through traffic, no congestion charge. It's quite good, so that's paying pay any of that. No parking fees as well, it's a real bonus. Well, what prompted it, myself and my flatmate were watching Quadrophenia one night and literally thought, I've been wanting to do it for years, since I was a teenager. So I literally popped along here the next day and bought one. Uh, the best thing about riding a scooter in London for me is winding up Larry car drivers, who they're stuck in the traffic and you just leave them behind. They're absolutely great. I mean, you think you picture, you know, all those pictures with Charlton Heston jumping off on one in his Roman suit to uh, Dean Martin, you know, with that pretty girl in the back. I mean, they're just absolute fashion icons, or maybe fashion icons, not the, the right word, but style icons. So I thought to myself, when I was buying a Vespa, I'm going to choose a very retro looking bike, which, of course, I've seen in the movies and so on and so forth. That's what I went for. Just the accessibility. I mean, it's a 10 minute journey wherever I want to go, when I want to go. There's no, there's no stopping me. From a work perspective, getting to work, it's absolutely fantastic. You miss all the traffic or you can weave in and out the traffic if you dare. So that's great. So you can get into work, I can get into work, what, within five minutes? But if I take the tube or get the bus, it's probably half an hour journey. So that's absolutely fantastic. So the advantages are really, with all this congestion around us, is getting around. So uh, that's, the, that's the very best part of it. But the great fun. And I can honestly say it's the best buy I've ever made. Because I've probably saved it in taxi fares in any case. So scootering in the city means you get to save loads of time, loads of money and loads of hassle when it comes to parking. But there's a downside. There are people who vandalise your scooter, there are people who try and steal your scooter and then you fall off. It's quite easy to come off it. Right. I've got to say, I mean, I had a crash on, just on Sunday um, and came off it, I kind of got a little graze on my arm and stuff. Um, people don't see you as much, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's about it. I'm also taking people, the weather, you know, during rain, it's not too pleasant riding around. The disadvantages really are, uh, the main one is obviously being other motorists as well. I mean, I drive as well. And uh, ever since I've been doing this, you know, beforehand, I probably didn't take much notice of motorcycles. I thought, well, they're not getting in my space. That's the disadvantage because it's a bit dangerous and there's nothing worse than seeing somebody come off the bike or somebody limping along. So that's the real disadvantage. Well, unlike popular belief, I just don't think there is a disadvantage. I mean, if you know how to ride, you're not going to have a problem. Now, of course, one of the most famous names in the world of scootering was Lambretta. Still with us as a high street fashion brand, but no longer as a scooter. They ceased production in Italy in 1972. But do you know the connection between Sir Cliff Richard and the Lambretta? Answer after the break. Now, before the break, I was wondering if you knew the connection between the Peter Pan of Pop, Sir Cliff Richard, and the Lambretta scooter. Well, after they finished making scooters in Italy, they moved production to Look Now in India, which was the birthplace of Cliff Richard. I bet you never knew that. Maxi scooters are getting increasingly, well, maxi. Bigger, heavier, faster, and more expensive. But in the UK, Aprilia's bestseller is the Atlantic 125. Only 125 cc's, but good for 70 miles an hour. Peugeot's Ellie Star 125 is probably a bit on the small side to be considered a true maxi scooter, but for three grand, you get a big top box, a big screen, and handlebar muffs with fur in. Nice. Yamaha's Majesty 250 has been the biggest selling maxi scooter in Italy for a number of years, so it must be pretty good. I know there's a European designed and built Yamaha maxi scooter, it's called the Versace 300 and it costs £4,000. A bit more compact than the Majesty. You'll see an identical machine badged MBK and that's because it Demers makes it in France, but don't let that put you off. 
Honda, on the other hand, can with some justification claim to have invented the Maxi Scooter with their CN250 Helix from about 10 or 12 years ago. These days, their Maxi Scooter is called the Silverwing, the only slightly smaller brother to the mighty Goldwing, and you get just about everything you might expect to find in a family car. A huge amount of luggage space, fantastically comfortable accommodation for driver and passenger, even a stereo with the controls up here on the handlebars. The Piaggio X9 comes in various varieties from 125 right up to 500cc and boasts some truly innovative features like an integrated helmet system that allows you to chat on your mobile or listen to a radio or a CD player and you can even have a powered stand. But Maxi scooters aren't for everyone. Some people prefer the traditional scooter. So who better to go along and see than the longest established scooter dealer in the country, Claude Aegis, to find out the enduring appeal of the classic Vespa. Right, well, the nature of the scooter market has changed a hell of a lot in the last few years. And if you ask anyone about it, you might as well ask Claude Aegis because he's been running a scooter shop here in London for how long have you been? Since 1950. What sort of new people are you seeing coming to the market? Because presumably they're coming through your door every day. What's, how is it changing in the type of people that are getting well, onto a Vespa? We haven't had much change. All our, ch all our commuters were barristers, solicitors, all different uh, walks of life. Uh, more females are coming in now than, than, than before. Yes, young ladies are buying scooters. What about the numbers? I mean, pe people keep talking up the growth of the scooter market, but is that is that the reality for you, or is it is it creeping up rather than rocketing away? Uh, it's, cre it's creeping up a bit now because there's so many models, there's so many dealerships. Uh, it's not as it was before because there's different manufacturers coming in on the market all the time, as far as I'm concerned, and that more is more of a, a market for everybody. Do you think that's helped to attract car drivers, get them out of the cars and onto scooters? Because when I was into Vespa back in the 80s, it was a fashion thing, and we were really the only people that you saw on them, the scooter boys and mods, it, and you saw very few scooters on the streets. It's still a fashion thing, that's for certain, but it's a commuter fashion thing now. It's commuters need it to commute, to go to and from work, which is probably the only means of travel now. I mean. The congestion charge and the traffic is just traumatic and there's no, uh, not at the moment anyway, any, any, any other form of transport. So Claude, the big difference seems to me between the market that you're in and, and the general scooter market is the amount of accessories that you stock. It, is it very different in terms of the people that buy the traditional Vespa? Uh, no, not really. I mean the, the traditional Vespa, the old Vespa classics are this side and they still do the chrome rear carriers, front carriers, crash bars, front bumpers and the late bikes, the ET2s, ET4, yeah. GTs, uh, is this side and it's still, they're, a, they're the same format as the uh, yeah. old classic but people still want them because they're decorative and they do protect, Yeah, they do protect the scooter in a, a collision or anything like that and they are attractive. What about this model, the GT, do you think that's going to open the market oh, up and it's that, a cracking bike isn't that, it? That is fantastic. And it's got a lot of performance hasn't yes, it? Do you think that's going to attract motorcyclists, people who might have bought a motorbike because it's not? so yes. quick and... Yes, uh, uh, definitely the motorcyclists, will, when they get on one of them, they will definitely want to buy it. Or something like that, maybe not that style, but a scooter with that capability of speed and comfort and road holding because as I said, you go over sleeping policemen with them and they hold the road, not like other, the other models which are good in their time but sort of waver all over the place. So this is the future, is it, for yes. scooters? Yes. High performance, better road holding, speed, comfort, reliability. And looks, and it still looks, it still yeah. looks retro. It is, it's a belting yeah, looking bike as well. It is, And here is a very persuasive and solid argument for actually riding and using a scooter in London. We've actually got clamps outside the scooter shop while we were filming scooters, just to prove it's our car. There you go, definitely ours. Definitely clamped, 115 quid to you, mate. One of the biggest costs when it comes to owning a scooter, which of course is much more affordable than either a motorcycle or a car, is the insurance. Now, Simon, you're an insurance professional. Are there any special issues or problems with scooter insurance? Yeah, scooter insurance, a bit similar to bike insurance, big, big problem for the industry as a whole is theft insurance. A couple of years ago, it's got slightly better now, but a couple of years ago, something like 60% of all bikes that were being insured were being stolen. 
That's scooters. That's, yeah. That's scooters. Yeah. Uh, reason being, they're very light. They can go back into in the back of a transit van. Uh, big problem for insurance companies. If somebody's got a lot of experience in a car or a bike, does that make any difference uh, to their insurance? What we're finding nowadays is a lot of, lot of experienced bikers who may have a Blade or an R1 um, are now actually turning to scooters for a, a form of um, commuting. Yeah. So those people obviously present a completely different risk to the younger people in the marketplace who actually aren't bikers but find uh, scooters a very affordable way of commuting. They present different problems because they've got no experience Compare that to someone who's ride, ridden a Blade or an R1 or just been biking for a number of years, completely different risks. So the, the older guy with a bigger scooter, not a problem. Younger guys, it's going to cost them a bit more. Insurance is a bit dull, but everyone would agree you need it. When it comes to training, though, opinions are mixed. The scooters, they're relatively low-powered, they're twist and go. How much training do you need? I do agree that perhaps a little bit more training could be incorporated into it. Uh, perhaps a little bit more publicity to try and encourage more into actually doing the training and actually getting onto the scooters, especially the uh, born again bikers. But I also believe that uh, car drivers, lorry drivers, etc., should be better educated in watching out for, for two wheel users. Reason being, I know several driving instructors myself, and when they're teaching people, when they re come into road ends, things like that, they say, is there any cars, buses, etc., coming? They never ever mention motorcycles, and it's something that really ought to be picked up on. Really, they ought to be a lot better educated, the four-wheel users. Well, that would help, but there are still a lot of riders out there who can't see the dangers that are involved in any two-wheel vehicle, no matter how small feeling really with sort of scooters is that people go on, jump on them, do a CBT, quite happily then will sort of fly around all over the, you know, the roads with unknown dangers approaching them. Uh, I feel it's a case of now we need to take people on to try and improve safety for the two-wheel road user. Um, in particular you've got the sort of 16, 17 year olds who don't appear to have any sort of sense of danger. They will go out there, they'll sort of think it's nothing wrong without putting any form of protection whatsoever. And I think, you know, it's hard reality if suddenly they see the loss of toes, bare skin, down to bone or whatever you want to say, that, you know, that they're going to end up with. Um, I feel there's a need that we should be taking people on, whether it be a formulated government run scheme or something like ourselves, whereby we will take people out and try and point out to them dangers that are on the road, giving them advance, you know, looking down the road further, seeing the dangers before they actually get to a situation that they can't react to. That's all rather serious but necessary stuff. So I tell you what, let's have a bit of fun. Women and scooters, a fine combination. And with that in mind, I asked a female friend of mine to pop up to Manchester. I had a job for her. Meet Adele Burton. She's a full-time motoring journalist. She drives all the new cars and she knows what she likes. Right, well, you're a motoring journalist, yes. so you're used to testing machines and vehicles. Uh -huh. It's just that these vehicles have got two wheels instead of four. So what we've got is three of the best-selling 50cc scooters on the market. These are the ones that are trying to get people out of the cars. We've got the Peugeot Jet Force, we've got the Vespa ET2, and on the end, the Aprilia SR50, looking rather fetching in its limited edition Spider-Man paint job. So off you go, onto the main streets of Manchester, Come back and tell me what you think. I'm off to grab a cappuccino. The classic retro twist and go is surely the Vespa ET2 brought to you by those fine people at Piaggio. It's steel bodied, just like those Vespas from the swinging 60s. And that means it's a bit lardy, so the performance from this two stroke 50cc engine suffers. There is a four stroke version available for £100 more. It's stylish, it's well equipped, it's well made, and it only costs £1,600. It's a consistent bestseller, and it's no wonder why. 
At £1,800 on the road, the Aprilia SR50 DTEC looks like a very expensive piece of kit. But what a lot you get for your money. It looks fantastic, it handles beautifully, the brakes are phenomenal. But its best feature is probably that DTEC 50cc engine, the first Aprilia have made themselves. Improved fuel economy and performance with major environmental benefits. I had Spider-Man wallpaper when I was 11, but I don't know if I want it on my scooter. Peugeot's speed fighters kept them right at the top of the scooter sales chart for the last few years. And this is the Jet Force 50, even more aggressively super bike like in its styling. It's got a trick aluminium frame, super sophisticated suspension, and a fuel injected engine. Those 13 inch wheels and the link braking system mean assured handling and stopping performance. There's a 125 supercharged version on the way, and it looks There Hello. you are. Did you have fun? I had a fantastic day. It's been brilliant. I got your coffee. It might have gone cold because <laughs> you've been gone a while. Thank you very much. So, come on, put them in order, the three scooters for me. The Peugeot, the Aprilia and the Vespa. Well, for me, third place, it's got to be the Peugeot. Too much like a motorcycle for me. It's big, it's bulky and very, very heavy. I found problems, junctions, It was I was wobbling and it was just too difficult, really. So, seat was too high. It's not a step female. through either, is it? No, that's it. You, so it's it kind takes, of half the point of a scooter has been this, doesn't that's it? That's it. It that takes away the essence chassis. of the scooter for me. And there was I, problems with the throttle, the uptake of the, the transmission. What was That's the, it. As soon as you're pulling out of junction, there's a real slur on transmission. So if a car's coming, you pull out, you can be too slow. And it, I think it can be quite dangerous, to be honest. So it's the, the Peugeot in third. <laughs> Second? Second, it's got to be the Aprilia. The Aprilia. I did like it. Very, very nimble, very light, easy, easy city bike. But I don't know, the styling for me, very, very boyish, I'd yeah. say. Especially the Spider-Man <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I, the Spider-Man thing, I think, if you were 11, great. But even 16-year-old lads no, would find not. that a bit. Definitely not. It's very, very off-putting, I think, the Spider-Man. Yeah. So. Great engine, the, the Ditec oh, or Ditec. Ditec, yeah. yeah, very, very good. Very, very Smooth. good. Perfor Performance-wise, you can't fault it. But, boy, so. is it loud. <laughs> How for loud sure, is that sure. scooter? If you're behind cars, everybody can hear you. Pedestrians on the street are turning, looking. It's just, it's too loud. Which too leaves loud. us with number My one. Favorite, the Vespa. You yeah. can't fault it. Classic 60s retro styling. It just, is cute, isn't it? Oh, it's cute. It's sexy. It's just got the old Italian chic, really. Gucci clad, I think. I can imagine myself Gucci clad driving down. And it's very, very hushed as well. That compared to the other two, engine-wise, that it's just it's smooth. The way the controls work, there's a feel of quality about the Vespa, isn't there? The other two are oh, a bit clunky very, and a bit plasticky, so. but there's a real quality feel definitely, to it. Definitely, definitely quality. And, and things like practicality, the seats. That's the, it. It's, height it's of the seat. low, especially for females as well. It's it's the lowest out of the three, and you've just got no problem standing at junctions, traffic lights. It's just easy to manoeuvre. So, my favourite. Your favourite? <laughs> Definitely. So which one would you take with you? Oh, Vespa. Can I take it? You can't. No. I might be able to stretch to a sandwich though, are you hungry? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Piaggio have been selling scooters by the million for nearly 60 years now, and a big part of the market has always been women. Partly because, well, they're so damn stylish, but it's not just about the way they look. Uh, I think probably as a scooterist myself, the most important thing is that you're able to handle the machine. Um, so things in terms of a bike being fairly lightweight and, and being able to put your feet on the ground, uh, being able to easily put it onto a centre stand. So those are the sort of things really that I think are, are, as a female rider are quite important. The ET range has been hugely successful yeah. uh, among women. Was the ET range specifically designed with women in mind? To be honest, it, it wasn't. Um, I mean, our market is 80% is male. But um, some of our products do have a slight female bias, and, and I suppose the reason that ET has been is, is size. It's very compact, it's still fairly lightweight, and, and girls feel quite comfortable with it. And the styling is very uh, retro, very chic, so again, that, that appeals to the female rider who's perhaps a little bit more image conscious. You know, the Piaggio Zip is, even though it's not specifically designed for women, it, it was designed with women in mind as well because the, the, the weight of the bike is so small and, it, and for, for a lot of men they would probably find that they would be a bit too big and find it a little bit uncomfortable to ride. So that's possibly um, one of the first bikes that, that you could say was designed for women really. 
Well, that's the ladies taken care of. Time to talk big boys' toys. Oh dear, that'll get me in trouble. But I wonder, can you tell me the connection between the legendary bike builders Ducati, Harley Davidson, and Triumph? Answer after the break. <laughs> Before the break, I asked you to make a connection between legendary bike makers, Ducati, Triumph and Harley-Davidson. And unsurprisingly, the answer is they all made scooters. Harley's was called the Topper. They don't make it anymore, which is just as well, because it was simply ugly. In America, they call this a scooter. Strange Americans. <laughs> but let's get back to basics, shall we? This is Peugeot's new Nifty 50. It's called the Ludix and it's been built to compete with cheapies from China and Taiwan. Available here in the UK from February 2004, the price a ludicrously affordable £1,000. Another big name in small scooters is Aprilia. This is their best-selling SR50 and it has the amazing Ditec engine. Hugely reduced emissions, improved fuel economy and better performance, or so they claim. Causing a major commotion in small wheel circles was this handsome beast. Now we've already seen the 50cc version of Peugeot's ultra aggressive Jet Force, but this is a proposed 125cc supercharged version which would really give it the performance to match its looks. Well, I'm looking around the shore and I've moved over to the Tri a scooter area and lo and behold I bumped into a friend of ours, Adele, who saw earlier, scooting stylishly around the streets of Manchester. Seen anything you fancy at I've the show? I've seen plenty, I fancy. Three in particular caught my eye today. The first yeah. one's got to be the, the Yamaha B-Wiz, definitely. Well that was, the, that was the scooter that really started to make scooters trendy again. And What, what is it about it that you like? Well for me it's not got the, the sporty styling that you see a lot nowadays. It's, it's very, very basic in my eyes. Just a st simple step on and off you go. Very affordable as well, oh, isn't definitely, it? definitely, definitely. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, it was the Easy Rider DX. Well that bike is actually based on the old Honda Dax from the 90s. 70s. It's a really funky little sort of moped scooter very, thing, very isn't funky. it? It's very, funky. It's not your original scooter styling, but all the chrome, it shines, it's original. Oh, and it's just a fantastic little eye catcher. What about your favourite? Favourite's got to be the best of the ET4. It was just fantastic. It's got styling, it's cool, and it's got power. The ET2 just didn't do it for me. At full throttle, it wasn't going fast enough, whereas the 125cc, it goes. Right, well, enough talking. You fancy doing a bit more riding? Well, definitely. Off you go, then. Do you know what? She's getting into this. Now, having already enjoyed the freedom of the open road, Adele wasn't going to be that impressed with a tiny little indoor track. But at least it gave her a chance to try out the MBK version of Yamaha's ultra funky slider while I had a chat with my friend Mike. So, Mike, just tell us what you're doing here at the show. Okay, Steve. I mean, we set the tri scooter feature up here because a lot of people come to a show who are what we would class as dreamers. They come along and they look at the glitz, they look at the glamour, and we give them the opportunity here, under a safe environment with qualified instructors, to actually have a go on the scooters that are available, to give them that little urge forward to look at training can be a positive thing. I think there's a fear factor here. People will look at them and think this is a great thing to do, but that first opportunity of getting the leg over onto a bike and then riding it puts a lot of people off and entering into a training school, whether it's an unknown environment. Here, they've got the vibe going, they've got the whole thing happening. We can get them, whilst they're still hot, give them that feeling for just 10 minutes and show them how easy it actually is. What are you, as rider training organisation and the industry doing as a whole to try and encourage people to get on a scooter, get, get out of the car, leave the superbike at home and use the scooter for the daily commute? A lot of training schools out there, a lot of them are very good, but the public don't know who's good and who's bad. So what we want to do is try to increase the safety generally across the board and increase the standards so that everybody's getting a recognised standard across the board so they're feeling a lot happier about coming to schools. Yeah. And what if somebody is thinking about getting a scooter, uh, they want to get some training, how can they sort of find out, other than coming here, how can they find out where they can get training and stuff like that? Call the Driving Standards Agency, they're our governing body, they will give you all your local schools. Look in yellow pages. The important thing I would say is actually check out the facilities before you pay your money though. There's a lot of people out there who will be charging the same money, make sure you're getting qualified instructors at a reputable site. 
and that everybody who wants to ride a two-wheeler now has to take compulsory-based training. It's a course that is designed for both geared and automatic bikes. Obviously, we will teach whatever person wants to ride whatever bike. So if somebody comes on a scooter, we're there, we can get them, show them how it all works, get them into a safe environment before we actually head out onto the road. The whole point of the Try A Bike Arena was to get people on a scooter who perhaps have never ridden one before. There was a real cross-section of people. What did they make of it? Yeah, it was good. It was a good laugh. A little bit underpowered, uh, slightly less uh, power than the supermoto, which I'm used to. Um, I was a bit nervous in the beginning, but once I got the throttle control, it was much better. I've never ridden a scooter before, and um, well, I've ridden one once, but I always wanted to pull the clutch in. It's a good chance to try a few bikes here that you don't normally get to try. Uh, the twist and go sort of things, and uh, easy to park, aren't they? Yeah, I would. I probably won't have a 50. I'd want 100, I think. This it's is simple. the first time on a scooter. That's why I was a bit nervous and I kept on pressing the front brake thinking it has a clutch. I've got a 14 year old lad and he's uh, did a bit of motocross when he was younger. Uh, so yeah, he's uh, looking to get into supermoto as well now. So yeah, I might well get him one of these for the road when he's a little bit older. Look, because I'm a taller sort of guy, a lot of these manufacturers tend to make the handlebars quite low. And uh, when you're going around tight corners, it tends to touch on the knees, so you're restricted a little bit on choice. So, yeah, great for a laugh. I would imagine it's brilliant fun on the road. I really enjoyed it. I did. It was been really nice. But it was a good opportunity then to have a go on one, yeah. Just get on the no fuss, and it's a good opportunity to try stuff out here. Well, they all seem to think it was a damn good idea. But what about Adele, who had so managed to get out in the arena without wearing one of the dreaded orange tabards, preferring something stylish and leather as she would? But what about the slider, the MVK? Would she prefer its more modern look to a beloved retro Piaggio? Well, what do you think? New fare for it? No, still the ET4 for me, I think. You enjoyed riding these scooters, though, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, very, very agile, but doesn't and be the ET4. Ready for something with a bit more power than a 50? Yeah, definitely. Right, well, just the other day, I got a chance to try something with considerably more power than a 50. A new scooter from perhaps the best known name in scooters. Tradition. We are surrounded by it. When something's worked perfectly well for as long as anyone can remember, why on earth would you want to change it? I mean, a lot of people got very upset indeed when BMW said that they'd made a Mini, and that's because the original Mini, the real Mini, as they would say, was more than just a car to them, it was a way of life. So, when I heard that Piaggio were making a Vespa that was liquid-cooled rather than air-cooled, four-stroke rather than two-stroke, and worst of all, had absolutely no means of manually shifting gears, I nearly choked on my cappuccino. <laughs> But that was before I actually saw a Vespa Gran Turismo in the flesh. And, well, just look at it. Well, I was won over by the classic looks of this Vespa GT. It's big, it's voluptuous, it's curvaceous. It's like a sort of Gina Lollabrigida or Sophia Loren of scooters. Try and translate it for that for the kids. It's a bit like, uh, it's more your Jordan than your Britney. It's big and buxom, but I like it. Well, the riding experience doesn't disappoint either. These big engine twist and goes, anything sort of over a one, two, five can be really jerky on takeoff. But well, this one is so smooth and so talky. The performance is it's quite startling, really. If you're used to traditional geared Vespas like I was, my 150 Super would struggle to outpace a vigorously propelled BMX bike. But this Vespa GT will have virtually any car from a standing start over about the first 250 metres. And that means that in the city, it's just about unbeatable. There is a problem when it comes to parking though. Not that it's hard to park, just that it attracts all kinds of attention from all kinds of people. And I really do mean all kinds of people. Uh, I'll just have a look at this motorcycle here, this uh, Vespa here, sorry. And being a motorcyclist of probably about 48, 49 years experience, I think they're a smashing machine. Uh, you can drive in all sorts of weather with them, you, you, like the uh, semi uh, 
leg seals on the front. Your, your legs are, are absolutely nice and dry when it's raining down. Uh, easy to clean. Nippy, you know, when you're going about traffic. Uh, and for, for my money, they're absolute, you know, bang on kind of thing. Lovely, nice and clean. And take you anywhere and cruise all day probably at about, what, 55, 55 miles an hour. I don't know the fuel consumption, but I should imagine like it's a very, very economical to run. If the Piaggio Vespa GT is to live up to its name of Gran Turismo, it has to be more than just an around town point and squirt toy. It has to cut the mustard out here on the open road. To take two people and a decent amount of luggage somewhere nice for the weekend and they've got to enjoy the trip. Nice, fat, juicy rubber, powerful disc brakes and a stiff chassis for a scooter make the Vespa GT a real joy to ride out on roads like this. You'd be very surprised how fast you can chuck this thing through the corners. It's got much better ground clearance than any scooter I've ever ridden before. You know, I wondered if I'd like this new Vespa GT, and the truth is that I don't. I absolutely adore it. I love the performance, the style, the comfort, the practicality, and the price isn't too bad either, just under three grand on the road. My wife likes it, my 14-year-old daughter says it's the coolest thing I've brought home in years. But what about a chap who doesn't just like or love Vespa, he lives, eats and breathes Vespa. If you cut him open, there's a Piaggio symbol tattooed on his heart. Eric owns ESP Scooters in Wigan, a place of worship for devotees of traditional scooters. Me and Eric go way back, and he couldn't resist reminding me of the last time we met. Remember, Steve, this time I'm not lending you one. Last time you lent one, you knackered it. <laughs> I didn't, I just bent the number plate a bit. Wheel. I was just proving that Vespa's can pull wheelies. Yeah, you should have <laughs> stayed on it with the bike. Hey, I'll tell you what, these are two absolutely beautiful bikes. Really early Vespas, these, aren't they? Just yeah. tell us what they are. Uh, they're just like uh, 9412 twos and that. Uh, From uh, the early 50s or the mid 50s? This one's a bit earlier. This yeah. is like the late 40s and that one's the 50s. Blimey, so I mean, they only started in 1946, 47, didn't they? So yeah. are they really rare? I mean, they were, they were mass produced right from the start, weren't they? So are they exceptionally rare or, or are they quite easily available? They are easier available if you go to Italy. I mean, they, they yeah. still have these on the roads, but over here they've all rotten and felt bits. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, these are actually imports what I've, you know, got from Italy and uh, restored them myself. What are they actually like to ride? I mean, they're lovely to look at and everything, but are they a bit of a nightmare to ride, actually? No, they're, they're quite good. I mean, uh, you know, I could actually start one up and let you have a go, but after past experience, I think that would be a bad idea. <laughs> these, <laughs> these are a bit too uh, rare and fragile for, for my riding style, I think. Yeah, well, they are. the only thing they've got for today is they've not got the speed with them. They're quite slow. Yeah. I mean, 40, 45, and that's it, which is really a little bit of a disaster for the speed cars go up and, you know, yeah. on the road today. Like, it's not, not really viable to have these on the road. The thing about Vespas, though, Eric, is that there's not... It's one of those things that was absolutely spot on right from the start, wasn't it? The design of it, the monocoque chassis, the engine hanging off the side, air cool, single-sided fork on the front. That, it stayed like that for the best part of 50 years, really, didn't it? It's, it's never changed, really. It's never changed. The engine's still the same. All right, they've, they've put additional things like electric stir cut, oil injection and that, but the forks in the end are the same. It's still, you know, one spindle, one yeah. wheel, one nut, yeah. and the engine's still exactly the same. You no, know, Eric, I've been riding this new Vespa GT. I absolutely love it. I'll ask you about it in a minute. Yeah. But it's a sports scooter, and to some people, that's a contradiction in terms, but there's been sports scooters before, haven't there? Oh, uh, yeah, like the Lambretta, I mean, for instance, I mean, that has a sports disc brake on, and uh, 
motorbikes, you know, they've got scooters to thank because the Lambretta was the first production two wheels ever to have a disc brake. Vespers as well, like the, the Rally 200, the GS, oh, yeah. they would have kept up with a motorbike at the same capacity. An outstripped a family car easily, wouldn't they? Yeah. A Cortina or a Viva from that era, yeah, they would I mean, have blown good, it in the weeds. A good rally, you could get like 70, 75 out. Now, Eric, I've been riding this new Vespa GT. I was a bit wary. It's an automatic, it's a four stroke, it's liquid cool, but I like it. What do you think of it? Truthfully, it's not my cup of tea, Steve. You can keep them. Not one way. Well, something that is most definitely my mug of steaming Darjeeling is this thing, the Sax Madass. Okay, strictly speaking, it's not a scooter, more of a sort of mountain bike with an engine strapped to it. But if you were 16 and I told you you could have one of these, for about 1,500 quid, well you would, wouldn't you? Especially if I pointed out that these lights are exactly the same as those in a Ducati 999. So from something that isn't actually a scooter to lots of things that are, a look back at all the scoots we've seen in the show. <laughs> Well, that's it, it's been fun, and I hope as well we've changed your mind about scooters. Do you like me monkey? Well, they are paying me peanuts. <laughs>